بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ممبر آف نیشنل اسمبلی میڈم بازارا سیفی صاحبہ پرنس میاں گل عدنان صاحب مائی فرینڈ امبیسڈرز اینڈ ایکسلنسیز ڈاکٹر محمد علی صاحب وائس چانسلر قائد اعظم یونیورسٹی وینریبل جیو چینگ فرام ملیشیا مانگس اسپیکرز ایکسلنسیز لیڈیز اینڈ جینٹل مین السلام علیکم اٹ گیوز می گریٹ پلیجر ٹو ٹیک پارٹ ان کانفرنس وچ ٹاکس اباؤٹ بدھزم دی آرکیولوجیکل سائٹس آف پاکستان and uh, the fact that uh, more exchange can take place between our people from throughout the world and there and symbolically a lot of you are here and that uh, we can encourage tourism but my attachment to buddhism has a longer history much longer in my search to find myself long ago <laughs> i found myself really <laughs> in my search to find myself i studied a lot of religions I studied Buddhism, I studied Hinduism, I read the scriptures, I read Christianity, I read Bible and uh, looked at other religions, of course, also Baha'ism, which was an attempt to bring all religions together and to look and talk about peace. And Akbar's deen e a a part of the sub, in the subcontinent and Sikhism. And that was a search for self. It was a search for answers why am i here what is the world all about what happens what happens after death that's the search still continues in fact it never ends you know and the more the more i see the more i understand that man is totally ignorant and man is a combination of all these things his desires and the shortness of life itself brings a different perspective on things you know um we can have a concept of the hereafter and try and do good you can have a concept of doing good even here trying to live in humanity with other people a humanism by itself becomes a religion later on when you talk about interfaith harmony but at the same time if you look at the world the world is full of wars the world is world is full of hegemonious attitudes what is mine is mine will not allow it to be shared and that is where buddhism was of extreme importance to me so therefore part of my tourism and part of my wife's tourism samina alvis tourism had involved these trips to sri lanka for example to thailand and we were fascinated by the temple of the holy tooth in kandy where buddha's tooth has been preserved and we knew less about pakistan's archaeological sites then and we traveled to thailand to look at the stupas and to understand the practice of prayer and to see the people praying there in different forms you know then interestingly we decided to go to tibet and we reached there uh, it was a funny very strange uh, thing which happened we had a little viral flu when we went into tibet and di we didn't realize what was happening as soon as we went to the hotel and the, our rooms were on the first floor we both of us got tired and we thought that this is this must be the virus which we <laughs> brought from islam i think we flew from islamabad the we have bought brought this virus from islamabad so we rested one day and the next day we went into the bazaar and again we were tired so we tried and rest uh, rested another half a day but then we saw thought that we are here only for four days and if we just give it half to all this weakness in the human body it will not serve us well so we went out we went to the potala palace and then we realized and when we saw there there were these honeymooning couples who who would uh, after marriage would come to the potala palace and all of them and which is which is now very common in pakistan also you can understand the fact that all of them had these small cans 
with a tube going into the nose because oxygen was scarce at that height. <laughs> Which can happen if you go to the Kaga, to the uh, Khunjara Pass and elsewhere. And then we realized that it was not our weakness or the virus, it was just lack of oxygen. So it was a very interesting trip even to Potala for um, the, 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 the smell of the yak um, oil which is burnt as a holy ceremony throughout the stairs you climb and all over. And a tremendous art resting there, tremendous valuables. So my link to Buddhism is therefore related to that. And the more I read about archaeological sites in Pakistan, I am impressed by the fact and I have heard people claim, and I am sure, Adnan, you, must, you had claimed that, that there are more Buddhist artifacts in Pakistan than anywhere in the world. I said, that is very interesting. That is very interesting. And the fact that the spread of Buddhism towards Korea, towards Japan, and to many other regions started from the north, from the Swat Valley, from the Hunza Valley. And these monks traveled, and there are some monks, even in the current age, who travel the same route, just in memory of the monks who preached Buddhism, and they went from Pakistan to Korea. And Pakistan has welcomed over the last few years delegation of venerable monks from Korea, from Thailand, from Sri Lanka, and I think that kind of interaction will help us preserve whatever we have and help us preserve and bring people together. Because today in the world, we do talk about, and we've talked about interfaith harmony for a very long time. But the history of mankind, if you look back, and I was speaking today in the morning on peace and uh, humane war, and I believe that man is stuck with his own psyche. Man has always fought man from the time of Hazrat Adam's children. It took one generation to start what the DNA in our minds are, uh, is made up of, you know. It includes love, it includes phobias, it includes hate. And I find very frequently that even, and I, had, and I had people raise their arms to one question of mine, but I'll come to that later. In, in these times, uh, we are a mixture of all that. So therefore, exploitation is in our fabric. Love and hate is in our fabric. You know, we like something beautiful, like a child here with innocent uh, uh, expressions, and we all love that. So we love, we have love and we also have hate, hatred and we have phobias. So it is very difficult and therefore the, the Buddhist struggle which I, which, which I imbibed was the fact that you can never be satisfied as long you have desires. You see a very important pillar of Buddhism which I said my, my, my relationship to Buddhism is more than archaeological sites and tourism, my relationship is personal. So many other religions talk about it and Buddhism also has addressed that. That as long as you have desires, you will not have peace. You will not find peace because desires never end. And I've seen it in my life, my desires never end. I've, and every person comes through that, you know. If you climb this stair, you'll have a desire to go higher. If you get this job, you'll have a desire to go higher. If you have this income, you'll have a desire to go higher. If you have this much power, you'll have a desire to go higher. That, in a lot of minds, creates stress. Why do I say in a lot of minds? Because some people may still find happiness in that. So therefore, there, there was a shift in a number of religions towards monasticism, to, towards ascetism, giving up things, pleasures of life. And a lot of religions imbibe that, you know, the, the fa fact that you fast and you give up one desire and to, not only you give up one desire, you, you make your body and your mind understand the spirituality even of food. That if it is prevented from you, how, how do you feel? So Buddha himself practiced that and he was 
uh, and all the images of the fasting Buddha talk about that. That was his search about what the body needs, what does the mind need. Can you give up things in life and still be happy? So that struggle is on with all of you, with me also. And I find I am surprised by what I find in people. People who acquire wealth, and I have acquired wealth also, so I am not denigrating that. People who acquire wealth, and they keep on doing that. They never stop. It's an endless thing. which doesn't stop. And the richer they are, the hungrier they are. They never stop. And some, somebody tells me, Chalo, iske paas to bhot daulat aagi, Chalo, ab isko chain pad jayega. It doesn't. <laughs> in fact, it is, I don't know, in fact, it is an ad addiction. Uh, if you were, if I were a doctor, for example, if I do, though I am, if I were a doctor, and somebody would come and tell me and complain about somebody and say, he started eating breakfast in the morning, and this is lunch time and he's still eating. Or somebody who started eating at lunch and this is dinner time and he's still eating. The doctor will say the person is sick. You see, his body doesn't need all that. So where does somebody draw a line? His body doesn't need all that. So if people acquire wealth and keep on acquiring wealth until they go down under, they, they, that, that is the kind of thing which Buddhism and Buddha preached more. So you curb your desires. Islam says the same thing, curb your desires. And if you curb your desires, then you may see other things in life. Humanity, love for people, understanding people, forgiveness. We are missing that. So we are a combination of emotions. And Buddhism has understood emotion very well. And the nirvana, which is talked about is the fact that when you give up your desires, then you may, you give up your desires, stress goes out of your family, reject what your body desires, bring it as a routine, something which you don't have to desire, it's just a part, like air, you keep on breathing air, it's a part of routine, it goes in the background, there's no search for air except when you're in, <laughs> for suffering from COVID, <laughs> then you understand the value of simple air, imagine, and the world has learned that, but have we? We have learned that as a disease, we have not learned that as something which is, which is a luxury and brings you back to humanity. So ladies and gentlemen, it is a very intriguing journey of my life. And uh, that journey continues as long as I am alive. That journey continues and Buddhism therefore is a very major part of it. And Pakistan has had, you see, the, the, uh, the uh, history of the Indus Valley civilization is anchored in Buddhism, is anchored in uh, Hinduism and a peaceful transition between Hinduism and Buddhism also. Monjadaro, for example, both peaceful transition and uh, Buddhism gave way to Hinduism in some areas and uh, it was spread to Afghanistan, therefore by the Bamiyan Buddha site. So this, this region was also at one time full of Buddhism and we would like to promote, preserve what we have, very important. It's a, it's a huge struggle always to preserve what we have to try and restore some of the damage at the same time, not restore all the damage to give the implication, to give the feeling to people that this is ancient history, to preserve some of the damage and to understand this, these huge civilizations which existed. If you go to Monjadaro, for example, you'll be surprised by that, by the fact that 5,000 years ago, 7,000 years ago, there was a grid-like city it was a, based on a grid. It was the, the houses were on the grid. There was no kachi abadi. There was no transgression on the thoroughfare. The water came from the Indus, went into every house and the sewage went out in a very planned manner. 5,000 years ago. Imagine. And it gave way. It vanished. Why did it vanish? Only because uh, the dependency of mankind with water was so important that as the river changes course, the civilization moved away. Civilizations throughout history 
have been close to water, whether it's the Nile, whether it's the Euphrates, or whether it's the Danube, whether it's uh, the Amazon, and whether it was the Indus Valley civilization. Some, it was our heritage, it is our heritage. And today, Pakistan is well placed to talk about peace because what we see more than ever before, there is polarization between people. More than ever before, this religious anchorage towards peace and understanding of each other. We need an anchorage to give up wars, not to have humanitarian wars, not to have, but do, not, not to have wars at all. It creates misery. It cre the, and who is most affected? The woman and the children. Wars have always created misery. Karoro, tens of millions have died in the last century. Tens of millions have died. And still, we, we still keep on. We have learned something else that we will never, we don't want to stop wars, but we don't want peace either. We just want to have humanitarian wars. We won't solve the Kashmir issue, but we won't have a full blown fight on it. So that's the kind of mentality which is progressing in the world. And I believe that going back to peaceful traditions is very important, not for you alone. Uh, I ask a question in the morning to the people, you know, because I want you to understand this conflict in the human mind. And I asked a question and asked people to raise their hands. And I'll also ask you here. How many of you, how many of you get angry? Imagine. The problem is here. <laughs> we have to manage that. And that by itself is, a, is my question for your own reflection. Because anger is against a person. Anger is frustration. Anger leads to reflexes. And I quoted something else also. Those who get angry frequently, like my late father, Allah Ta'ala, Makfrat Kare, like my late father, he would tell me, and Samina is a good witness, he would tell me that when I get angry, I never say anything bad to anybody and my anger is in my control and I knew it was not. <laughs> So ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be here and to talk about peace. Thank you.